Our next guest is a three-time world champion skier who's been to two Olympic Games. He played professional football for the Steelers and the Eagles. And after injury cut his career short, he founded a marketing software company called Integrate. Forbes magazine said that he was one of the 30 most influential people under 30 in technology in 2013. It's my pleasure to welcome Jeremy Bloom to the stage. So, one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about, Jeremy, was the fact that so often we hear these cliches about, oh, it's really easy to go from being a high-performing sports person and just turn that straight into business. But I would argue that actually it's not the stuff that you learn becoming a high-performing sports person, but it's the thing that makes you a high-performing sports person, which also makes you potentially successful in business. Yeah. I, you know, I, actually, I think it's an interesting question because I think uh, as, a, as a professional athlete, um, our blind spot is we feel like we can do anything. And when I was in the National Football League, I, I went to Wharton, which is a business school um, in Pennsylvania. And one of my professors, the thing that, the, that stands out the most that he, he taught me was um, lose somebody else's money first. You know, before you go out and you know, start your own business or uh, you know, do your own venture, you know, join a company, learn the ins and outs, and, uh, and then start your own. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at the, the data around professional athletes of all different sports, yeah. you know, football, baseball, basketball, uh, the, the bankruptcy rate is really high, and it's a really big issue that the leagues have to deal with. But it's not just because, you know, they're, you know, buying big houses and fancy cars. It's that uh, a lot of times you make silly investments. Yeah, and also... It's a very short career, and unless you already have your eye on what you're going to do when that career finishes, um, maybe you're vastly unprepared for it. Um, when did you realize that you were going to have a career after being a sports person? Well, I hoped that it would happen at around 18. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was always pretty, pretty focused on what, what I would do next. Um, you know, when, when I was going through the ranks of, of football and skiing, I... Um, I won my, my first world championship at, at 18. My first Olympics was, was 18. And um, at 19, I was an All-American football player. And so I was kind of, you know, living both of my childhood dreams of, uh, of football and skiing. And, and I kind of, I got a little scared, to be honest with you, because I was wondering, what's my life going to look like after sports? Yeah. You know I mean? Really, at that stage, because a lot of people who are at the very peak at 18 and 19 are thinking, this is going to last forever, I'm bulletproof, I can do anything. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the youngest of three. Uh, my brother uh, pounded humility into me <laughs> at a very young age. So I, I knew that um, I wasn't invincible and I knew that at some point, you know, uh, I would have to transition. Can we maybe go back and, <clears throat> pardon me, talk about the skiing. Um, how do you get good at that? At what, what age do you realize that you're going to be able to compete nationally first and then internationally? Well, it started from humble beginnings. I was the youngest of three, so my mom and my dad and uh, my brother and sister would go ski together and they kind of pawned me off to my grandfather. And my mom was uh, this really big health food nut, so we, we weren't allowed to eat candy uh, growing up. But my grandfather was the complete opposite. And so he would pack his pockets full of these little miniature-sized candy bars. And I was, when I was three, four, five, and six, he would throw the candy down the mountain. And if I learned how to ski, I would be able to ski down and, and to, to get it. So um, it just, I mean, it started out as, as something that just, I, I could eat Snickers and Reese's <laughs> when my mom wasn't looking, which was pretty cool. Um, but then I saw the Olympics when I was 10. When I was 10 years old, I saw the, you know, freestyle skiing in the Olympics. Yeah. And uh, I said, wow, that's, that's amazing. I get, I, that's what I want to do. You obviously uh, have just arrived, so you might have missed David Epstein this morning. was our very first speaker, and, and he talked about how, unfortunately, in America at the moment, there's a culture of focusing very early on in a child's life on a single sport. You reach the top in two sports, so I guess you're an advocate for doing more than one sport as a child. Yeah, uh, you know, I, and look, I have a lot of friends like the gymnasts. You know, uh, Nastia Lukin is a good friend of mine. She's an American gymnast that won the all-around gold in 2008. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, her dad is a, an Olympic gold medalist, but yeah, from a very young age, I mean, she was put into a, uh, a program, a gymnastics program, and that was her life. Yeah. Um, for me, and it doesn't, I don't think it works, probably everybody's a little bit different, but for me, I just, um, when I was playing football, I felt like I was becoming a better skier. I was working on different skills, and I also ran track in, in, in high school, and I felt like, you know, that, that was helping me a, a, as well. Um, and there was many times in my narrative, in my history, where a ski coach would say, hey, you're 15 years old, you just made the United States ski team, you're the smallest guy out there on the football field, like, yeah. what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you know, uh, you're, you're going to get hurt and you, you lose your chance to maybe go to, to the Olympics someday, but I, I just, I always wanted to do both. When that pressure comes on, how easy is that to resist? Do you think long and hard about giving up one of them, considering... It's going to be a long time before you actually make it to the NFL. You've got to go through college. That's like almost eight or nine years away in, in, for most people. The average age, I think, is about 22, 23 getting into yeah. the NFL. And they're like, ah, you can have a, a, a chance at the Olympics right here, right now. You know, my, my parents made it easy for me because they, they never pushed me in, in, in one direction. You know, my mom and dad never said, hey, you're, you're going to be a football player. You, you know, your, your track is going to be the Olympics. Yeah. They always, you know, were just kind of behind me and saying, what do you want to do? I mean, what, what do you want for your life? And, you know, I'll, I'll never forget a conversation I had with my parents when I was 10 years old. I said, you know, I want to ski in the Olympics and, and I want to play in the NFL. And my mom said, you know, she's just this incredible woman who, who has a healthy disregard for the impossible. And she said, you know, you can, you can do that if, if you put your mind to it and, and you attack your dreams. And, and I think the use of the word attack was really what, what stood out to me because I, it really kind of solidified the fact that you can't, I couldn't just dream about it. I couldn't just think about it. I actually just really had to, had to attack it. Again, one of the things that we see so much from sports people is they climb their mountain. It's been something that they've been trying to do all their lives. And the next day or over the next period of time, they look around and they go, is that it? But obviously, in the background, you had this preoccupation of this fear beaten into you by your brother uh, that that's all going to finish. Was that a very natural thing for you when the time came to stop skiing at that level and to stop playing football at that level? Were you okay with that because you knew there was going to be a second life? No, I didn't know at all, and, and I was very worried about it. I was very concerned about it. I, it, it was probably my biggest fear in sports. My biggest fear wasn't not winning the Olympics or you know, maybe not making it in the National Football League, but it was what that transition was going to, to look like. So you know, I planted a lot of seeds, and I was proactive and did the Wharton program and joined a startup um, pretty soon after I, uh, I was finished, and I was running customer acquisition marketing. And I identified a, my biggest challenge or biggest uh, blind spot in, in marketing. There, there just wasn't a software for so left the company after a year and a half and started, uh, started Integrate. When you start Integrate, um, you raise money quite quickly. How important was your background and your profile in raising the money? Or does all that do is get you in the door because they're happy to see you, but if the idea is crap, they're going to go, off you go, mate. Thanks a million. <laughs> you know, we seeded the company ourselves, so we funded it, myself and a co-founder. Um, and then revenue started growing pretty quickly. and. Um, when we started to think about raising our, our Series A, um, I led those conversations, and I actually hid the, tried to hide the background as much as I could because I didn't want to be seen as, you know, here's this professional athlete that's, yeah. you know, trying to do something. And um, so, you know, not, it wasn't always possible, but there's a lot of, you know, venture capitalists that don't pay attention to professional sports, so they didn't, they didn't know, and others did. But I, I don't think it, uh, I don't think it helped. Um, you know, to your point, it might get you a meeting, but, you know, it's not going to get you an investment in a business. Are there any transferable skills that you learned from being a professional sports person to your day-to-day -day now as a CEO of a tech company? Or, again, it, like, it feels like sometimes we try and inflict easy patterns on people, but actually, sometimes yeah. they're just not there. Yeah, I think I take a lot from my experience in athletics and apply it to, to business. And I played for two very different organizations. Um, I was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles, um, which was a very top-down organization. So our head coach, who was Andy Reid, um, managed the, the team in a fear-based motivational way. Oh, yeah? So, 
you know, on a constant basis, almost daily, you, you know, as a player, you would, you would hear things like, hey, if you don't do the X, Y, or Z, you're out of here, we'll find somebody else to replace you. And what happened was it, it led to a locker room of people that were kind of all on their own islands, and they're all kind of worried about their own jobs. And so nobody could kind of lock arms and build a great culture yeah. and, and a family and environment that I think increases your likelihood of being successful. Um, we never went past the first round of the playoffs while I was with the Eagles, although on paper we had, you know, one of the most talented rosters I think the Eagles ever had. I mean, you know, Donovan McDab and Brian Westbrook and Brian Dawkins. And then I went to a, a Steelers organization that was completely different. Our head coach, who's still the head coach there today, Mike Tomlin, um, very bottom up. I mean, it was, a, it was an organization and team that, uh, you could lock arms. They yeah. didn't use use fear, and you know, just was a connected locker room. And in 2008, the year I was with the Steelers, uh, we won the Super Bowl. And and I don't think it was because you know that there was so much more talent inside that organization. I think management um, contributed to that a lot, and how they managed. So so to that point, yeah, I mean, the way um, I run Integrate, we have a, about 100 employees now. Um, I'm the CEO, and so I'm kind of the head coach. Uh, very transparent organization. You, you are the CEO, but you're also the owner. So the, the owner <laughs> and the of, player sometimes. Yes, but the the owner at the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Rooney family are kind of this legendary. They're the ones who are putting their arms out. So I'm, I'm guessing Mike Tomlin follows from them. Is that is that fair? No, I mean the Rooneys. Um, you know they they're not around much in the management of the team, at least from a player's perspective. Sure. I mean, Mike Tomlin is the leader, and Mike Tomlin is one of the best leaders I've ever been around in my entire life. I mean, he, he's just the type of guy that could, could go into a room of people that didn't think too highly of him and speak for an hour, and you know, nine out of ten people would probably walk out of the room with him. He's, just a, he's a transformational leader. What has he got that, that allows him to do that? Well, he is um, he's very transparent in the way he leads. And he has this uncanny ability to kind of look you in the eye and tell you when you're underperforming and do so in, in a way that just makes you want to get better. Yeah. You know, not doesn't put you on that fear-based island, but just like you feel bad that you're disappointing your coach. And he's a tough guy. Uh, he's kind of a man's man type of, type of leader. Um, and uh, he's just inspirational. Things he says just sticks to you. The... Um the professional football franchise has about, I don't know, 80 or 90 people who are all desperately trying to get on the 53-man active roster every Sunday. Skiing, you're on your own. It's like you, the mountain, two skis, and, yeah. and that's it. Um, these are incredibly different, and yet it sounds like maybe you have to have a very similar skill set to be able to perform at a very high level, and then it's just miniature differences almost in, in how you approach things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I think the the biggest difference between a team sport and an in individual sport is is when you win, you know, and it's a lot more fun to win with 53 yeah. other guys that contributed to it. But at the same time, in football, you could go out and have your best game that you've ever had in your entire life and lose the football game, so it's all for naught. Yeah. Where in skiing, you know, if I had my best run that day, I was the best in the world. Um, so you kind of controlled the outcome much more than I, I did in skiing than, than, I, than I did in football. The summit, obviously, um, the technology, the funding stuff has all gone over uh, in the, the main hall. Um, conferences like this for your business, are they, you're still growing rapidly? Are these actually very important? Is it about coming and telling everybody your story or is that the stage that you're at at the moment? Well, I met Dara, who was one of the founders, um, I guess six months ago or so, and he was telling me about Web Summit. I've never been here. This is my first time. I literally just landed today, haven't slept two days. Um, and uh, it's, an, it's amazing to me that this, this event's only four years old, and there's mm. 20,000 people yeah. that will come here this year. And by the way, that's up from 10,000 people uh, last year and 400 people the first year, right? So um, I'm just excited to take it all in. I mean, this is my... My, my, the first exposure I'm yeah. getting to it is, yeah. is with, with you, Jer, so thanks. <laughs> getting but, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. What's the story for the business now? What are you doing? How is that going? So the story of the business is uh, we're, we're a technical marketing software. And so what, what we do is, um, if you think about the funnel of advertising and, and the way you attract a prospect, there's the top of the funnel that's brand-focused, yeah. you know, just to create awareness 
for, for your product. And then there's kind of the middle of the funnel that is focused on actually generated a customer called performance marketing. And that area of marketing is very manual today. It's actually purchased the way display advertising was bought 20 years ago. So our goal um, the last four years has been to completely automate that part of the funnel, customer generation. So um, our customers are mainly B2B focused. IT companies like Dell, HP, Cisco, that are very focused on generating a targeted consumer through content syndication. So basically we make their performance marketing, we help them make their performance marketing more, more efficient. How do you, is that by programmatic advertising? And so eventually it's gonna be the ad agencies who come to you and say, you're stealing our jobs, maybe we can work with you? <laughs> yeah, a lot of it's through, through automation. So automating the supply and the buy side like a DSP did in display. And, yeah. um, but the, the, actually the bigger problem in the performance space is the quality of the data, the quality of the lead. Because as a consumer, we've all downloaded something and said, all right, I'm yeah. not going to put my email address. You know, I'll give somebody else's email address. Or, so I inaccurate data is actually a, a bigger issue. And so we've, we've gone about solving that so that we can validate each, each piece of lead at scale, millions and millions of pieces of data coming through and eliminate the, the, the bad leads and only... And that's not perfect, but but come close, yeah. uh, and then uh, get better better data into their marketing automation platforms, their CRMs. Listen, the uh, clock is running down there, so I'm going to let you go and have a wander around. Jeremy, right. thanks so much. It's been a real My privilege pleasure. to spend some time with your company. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Enjoy the rest of your stay.